Chapter 7 of Buried Alive by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 7. The Confession. That evening he was very excited, and he seemed to take no thought to disguise his excitement. The fact was, he could not have disguised it even if he had tried. The fever of artistic creation was upon him, all the old desires and the old existing joys. His genius had been lying idle like a lion in a thicket, and now it had sprung forth ravening. For months he had not handled a brush. For months his mind had deliberately avoided the question of painting, being content with the observation only of beauty. A week ago, if he had deliberately asked himself whether he would ever paint again, he might have answered, perhaps not. Such is man's ignorance of his own nature. And now the lion of his genius was standing over him, its paw on his breast, and making a great noise. He saw that the last few months had been merely an interlude, that he would be forced to paint or go mad, and that nothing else mattered. He saw also that he could only paint in one way, Priam Fowle's way. If it was discovered that Priam Fowle was not buried in Westminster Abbey, if there was a scandal and legal unpleasantness, well, so much the worse. But he must paint. Not for money, mind you. Incidentally, of course, he would earn money. But he had already quite forgotten that life had its financial aspect. So, in the sitting room in Werter Road, he walked uneasily to and fro, squeezing between the table and the sideboard, and then skirting the fireplace, where Alice sat with the darning apparatus upon her knees, and her spectacles on. She wore spectacles when she had to look fixedly at very dark objects. The room was ugly in a pleasant Putneyish way, with a couple of engravings after B. W. Leader, R.A., a too realistic wallpaper, hot brown furniture with ribbed legs, a carpet with the characteristics of a retired governess who has taken to drink, and a black cloud on the ceiling over the incandescent burners. Happily, these surroundings did not annoy him. They did not annoy him because he never saw them. When his eyes were not resting on beautiful things, they were not in this world of reality at all. His sole idea about house furnishings was an easy chair. Harry, said his wife, don't you think you'd better sit down? The calm voice of common sense stopped him in his circular tour. He glanced at Alice, and she, removing her spectacles, glanced at him. The seal on his watch chain dangled free. He had to talk to someone, and his wife was there, not only the most convenient, but the most proper person to talk to. A tremendous impulse seized him to tell her everything. She would understand. She always did understand, and she never allowed herself to be startled. The most singular occurrences immediately they touched her were somehow transformed into credible, daily, customary events. Thus, the disaster of the brewery. She had accepted it as though the ruins of breweries were a spectacle to be witnessed in every street corner. Yes, he should tell her. Three minutes ago, he had no intention of telling her, or anyone, anything. He decided in an instant. To tell her his secret would lead up naturally to the picture which he had just finished. I say, Alice, he said, I want to talk to you. Well, she said, I wish you'd talk to me sitting down. I don't know what's come over you this last day or two. He sat down. He did not feel really intimate with her at that moment, and their marriage seemed to him, in a way, artificial, scarcely a fact. He did not know that it takes years to accomplish full intimacy between husband and wife. You know, he said, Henry Leake isn't my real name. Oh, isn't it? she said. What does that matter? She was not in the least surprised to hear that Henry Leake was not his real name. She was a wise woman and knew the strangeness of the world. And she had married him simply because he was himself, because he existed in a particular manner, whose charm for her she could not have described, from hour to hour. So long as you haven't committed a murder or anything, she added with her tranquil smile. My real name is Priam Fowle he said gruffly. The gruffness was caused by timidity. I thought Priam Farr was your gentleman's name. To tell you the truth, he said nervously, that was a mistake. That photograph that was sent to you was my photograph. Yes, she said, I know it was, and what of it? I mean, he blundered on, it was my valet that died, not me. You see, the doctor, when he came, thought that Leek was me, and I didn't tell him differently because I was afraid of all the bother. I just let it slide, and there were other reasons. You know how I am. 
I don't know what you're talking about, she said. Can't you understand it? It's simple enough. I'm Priam Fowl, and I had a valet named Henry Leake, and he died, and they thought it was me, only it wasn't. He saw her face change and then compose itself. Then it's this Henry Leake that's is buried in Westminster Abbey, instead of you. Her voice was very soft and soothing, and the astonishing woman resumed her spectacles and her long needle. Yes, of course. Here he burst into the whole story, into the middle of it, continuing to the end, and then going back to the commencement. He left out nothing and nobody, except Lady Sophia and Twistle. I see, she observed. And you've never said a word? Not a word. If I were you, I should still keep perfectly silent about it, she almost whispered persuasively. It'll be just as well. If I were you, I shouldn't worry myself. I can quite understand how it happened, and I'm glad you've told me. But don't worry. You've been exciting yourself these last two or three days. I thought it was about my money business, but I see it wasn't. At least that may have brought it on like. Now the best thing you can do is to forget it. She did not believe him. She simply discredited the whole story, and told in Werter Road like that the story did sound fantastic. It did come very near to passing belief. She had always noticed a certain queerness in her husband. His sudden gaieties about a tint of the sky, or the gesture of a horse in the street, for example, were most uncanny. And he had peculiar absences of mind that she could never account for. She was sure that he must have been a very bad valet. However, she did not marry him for a valet, but for a husband, and she was satisfied with her bargain. What if he did suffer under a delusion? The exposure of that delusion merely crystallised into a definite shape her vague suspicions concerning his mentality. Besides, it was a harmless delusion. And it explained things. It explained, among other things, why he had gone to stay at the Grand Babylon Hotel. That must have been the inception of the delusion. She was glad to know the worst. She adored him more than ever. There was a silence. No, she repeated in the most matter-of-fact tone. I should say nothing in your place. I should forget it. You would, he drummed on the table. I should, and what if you do? Don't worry. Her accents were the coaxing accents of a nurse with a child, or with a lunatic. He perceived now with the utmost clearness that she did not believe a word of what he had said, and that in her magnificent and calm sagacity she was only trying to humour him. He had expected to disturb her soul to its profoundest depths. He had expected that they would sit up half the night discussing the situation. And lo, I should forget it, indulgently, and a mild continuance of darning. He had to think, and think hard. Tears. Henry, she called out the next morning as he disappeared up the stairs, what are you doing up there? She had behaved exactly as if nothing had happened, and she was one of those women whose prudent policy it is to let their men alone even to the furthest limit of patience. But she had nerves too, and they were being affected. For three days Henry had really been mysterious. He stopped and put his head over the banisters, and in a queer, moved voice answered, Come and see. Sooner or later she must see. Sooner or later the already distended situation must get more and more distended until it burst with a loud report. Let the moment be sooner, he swiftly decided. So she went and saw. Halfway up the attic stairs she began to sniff, and as he turned the knob of the attic door for her, she said, What a smell of paint! I fancied yesterday... If she had been clever enough, she would have said, What a smell of masterpieces! But her cleverness lay in other fields. You surely haven't been Aspen all in that bathroom chair? Oh! This loud exclamation escaped from her as she entered the attic and saw the back of the picture which Priam had lodged on the said bathroom chair, filched by him from the bathroom on the previous day. She stepped to the vicinity of the window and obtained a good view of the picture. It was brilliantly shining in the light of morn. It looked glorious. It was a fit companion of many pictures from the same hand distributed among European galleries. It had that priceless quality at once noble and radiant which distinguished all Priam's work. It transformed the attic, and thousands of amateurs and students from St. Petersburg to San Francisco would have gone into that attic with their hats off and a thrill in the spine, had they known what was there, and had they been invited to enter and worship. 
Priam himself was pleased. He was delighted. He was enthusiastic. And he stood near the picture, glancing at it, and then glancing at Alice, nervously, like a mother whose sister-in-law has come to look at the baby. As for Alice, she said nothing. She had first of all to take in the fact that her husband had been ungenerous enough to keep her quite in the dark as to the nature of his secret activities. Then she had to take in the fact of the picture. Did you do that? she said limply. Yes, said he, with all the casualness that he could assume. How does it strike you? And to himself, this will make her see I'm not a mere lunatic. This will give her a shaking up. I'm sure it's beautiful, she said kindly, but without the slightest conviction. What is it? Is that partly bridge? Yes, he said. I thought it was. I thought it must be. Well, I never knew you could paint. It's beautiful for an amateur. She said this firmly and yet endearingly, and met his eyes with her eyes. It was her tactful method of politely causing him to see that she had not accepted last night's yarn very seriously. His eyes fell, not hers. No, 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 he expostulated with quick vivacity as she stepped towards the canvas. Don't come any nearer. You're at just the right distance. Oh, if you don't want me to see it close, she humoured him. What a pity you haven't put an omnibus on the bridge. There is one, said he. That's one, he pointed. Oh, yes, yes, I can see. But, you know, I think it looks rather more like a Carter Patterson van than an omnibus. If you could paint some letters on it, Union Jack or Vanguard, then people would be sure. But it's beautiful. I suppose you learned to paint from your... She checked herself. What's that red street behind? That's the railway bridge, he muttered. Oh, of course it is. How silly of me. Now, if you were to put a train on that... The worst of trains in pictures is that they never seem to be going along. I've noticed that on the sides of furniture vans, haven't you? But if you put a signal against it, then people will understand that the train has stopped. I'm not sure whether there is a signal on the bridge, though. He made no remark. And I see that's the Elk public house there on the right. You've just managed to get it in. I can recognise that quite easily. Anyone would. He still made no remark. What are you going to do with it? She asked gently. Going to sell it, my dear, he replied grimly. It may surprise you to know that that canvas is worth at the very least eight hundred pounds. There would be a devil of a row and a rumpus in Bond Street and elsewhere if they knew I was painting here instead of rotting in Westminster Abbey. I don't propose to sign it. I seldom did sign my pictures. And we shall see what we shall see. I've got fifteen hundred for little things not so good as that. I'll let it go for what it'll fetch. We shall soon be wanting money. The tears rose to Alice's eyes. She saw that he was infinitely more mad than she had imagined. With his £800 and his £1,500 for daubs of pictures that conveyed no meaning whatever to the eye, why, well, you could purchase real professional pictures of lakes and mountains, exquisitely finished at the frame makers in High Street for £3 apiece. And here he was rambling in hundreds and thousands. She saw that that extraordinary notion about being able to paint was a natural consequence of the pathetic delusion to which he had given utterance yesterday. And she wondered what would follow next. Who could have guessed that the seeds of lunacy were in such a man? Yes, harmless lunacy, but lunacy nevertheless. She distinctly remembered the little shock with which she had learned that he was staying at the Grand Babylon on his own account as a wealthy visitor. She thought it bizarre, but she certainly had not taken it for a sign of lunacy. And yet it had been a side of madness. And the worst of harmless lunacy was that it might develop at any moment into harmful lunacy. There was one thing to do, and only one. Keep him quiet. Shield him from all troubles and alarms. It was disturbance of spirit which induced these mental derangements. His master's death had upset him, and now he'd been upset by her disgraceful brewery company. She made a step towards him, and then hesitated. She had to form a plan of campaign all in a moment. She had to keep her wits and to use them. How could she give him confidence about his absurd picture? She noticed that naive look that sometimes came into his eyes, a boyish expression that gave the lie to his greying beard and his generous proportions. He laughed, until, as she came closer, he saw the tears on her eyelids. And he ceased laughing. She fingered the edge of his coat cajolingly. It's a beautiful picture. She repeated again and again. And if you like, I will see if I can send it for you. 
But Henry? Well, please, please don't bother about money. We shall have heaps. There's no occasion for you to bother, and I won't have you bothering. What are you crying for? he asked in a murmur. It's only, only because I think it's so nice of you trying to earn money like that, she lied. I'm, I'm not really crying. And she ran away downstairs, really crying. It was excessively comic, but he had better not follow her, lest he might cry too. A Patron of the Arts A lull followed this crisis in the affairs of No. 29 Werter Road. Priam went on painting, and there was now no need for secrecy about it. But his painting was not made a subject of conversation. Both of them hesitated to touch it, she from tact, and he because her views on the arts seemed to him to be lacking in subtlety. In every marriage there is a topic, there are usually several, which the husband will never broach to the wife, out of respect for his respect for her. Priam scarcely guessed that Alice imagined him to be on the way to lunacy. He thought she merely thought him queer, as artists are queer to non-artists. And he was accustomed to that. Henry Leake had always thought him queer. As for Alice's incredulous attitude towards the revelation of his identity, he did not mentally accuse her of treating him as either a liar or a madman. On reflection, he persuaded himself that she regarded the story as a bad joke, as one of his impulsive, capricious essays in the absurd. Thus, the march of evolution was apparently arrested in Werter Road during three whole days. And then a singular event happened, and progress was resumed. Priam had been out since early morning on the riverside, sketching, and had reached Barnes, from which town he returned over Barnes Common, and so by the Upper Richmond Road to High Street. He was on the south side of Upper Richmond Road, whereas his tobacconist's shop was on the north side, near the corner. An unfamiliar peculiarity of the shop caused him to cross the street, for he was not in want of tobacco. It was the look of the window that drew him. He stopped on the refuge in the centre of the street. There was no necessity to go farther. His picture of Putney Bridge was in the middle of the window. He stared at it fixedly. He believed his eyes, for his eyes were the finest part of him and never deceived him. But perhaps if he had been a person with ordinary eyes, he would scarce have been able to believe them. The canvas was indubitably there, present in the window. It had been put in a cheap frame, such as is used for chromographic advertisements of ships, soups and tobacco. He was almost sure that he had seen that same frame within the shop round a pictorial announcement of Taddy's Snuff. The tobacconist had probably removed the 18th century aristocrat with his fingers to his nose from the frame and replaced him with Putney Bridge. In any event, the frame was about half an inch too long for the canvas, but the gap was scarcely observable. On the frame was a large notice, for sale, and around it were the cigars of two hemispheres from Syac whiffs at a penny each to precious Murias, and cigarettes of every allurement and the multitudinous fragments of all advertised tobaccos, and meerschaums, and bras, and patent pipes, and diagrams of their secret machinery, and cigarettes and cigar holders laid on plush, and pocket receptacles in aluminium and other precious metals. Shining there, the picture had a most incongruous appearance. He blushed as he stood on the refuge. It seemed to him that the mere incongruity of the spectacle must inevitably attract crowds gradually blocking the street, and that when some individual not absolutely a fool in art had perceived the quality of the picture, well, then the trouble of public curiosity and of journalistic inquisitiveness would begin. He wondered that he could ever have dreamed of concealing his identity on canvas. The thing simply shouted, Priam Fall, every inch of it. In any exhibition of pictures in London, Paris, Rome, Milan, Munich, New York, or Boston, it would have been the sinusure, the target of ecstatic admirations, it was just another work as his celebrated Paul Dostanitz, which hung in the Luxembourg. And neither a frame of chemical gold nor the extremely variegated coloration of the other merchant's eyes on sale could kill it. However, there was no sign of a crowd. People passed to and fro just as though there had not been a masterpiece within 10,000 miles of them. Once a servant girl, a loaf of bread in her arms, stopped to glance at the window, but in an instant she was gone, running. Priam's first instinctive movement had been to plunge into the shop and demand from his tobacconist an explanation of the phenomenon. But of course, he checked himself. Of course, he knew that the presence of his picture in the window could only be due to the enterprise of Alice. 
he went slowly home. The sound of his latchkey in the keyhole brought her into the hall ere he had opened the door. Oh, Henry, she said. She was quite excited. I must tell you, I was passing Mr. Aylmer's this morning just as he was dressing his window, and the thought struck me that he might put your picture in. So I ran him and asked him. He said he would if he could have it at once. So I came and got it. He found a frame and wrote out a ticket and asked after you. No one could have been kinder. He must go and have a look at it. I shouldn't be at all surprised if it gets sold like that. Priam answered nothing for a moment. He could not. What did Aylmer say about it? he asked. Oh, said his wife quickly, you can't expect Mr. Aylmer to understand these things. It's not in his line. But he was glad to oblige us. I saw that he arranged it nicely. Well, said Priam discreetly, that's all right. Supposing we have lunch. Curious, her relations with Mr. Aylmer. It was she who had recommended him to go to Mr. Aylmer's, when, on the first morning of his residence in Putney, he had demanded, any decent tobacconist in this happy region? He suspected that, had it not been for Aylmer's bedridden and incurable wife, Alice's name might have been Aylmer. He suspected Aylmer of a hopeless passion for Alice. He was glad that Alice had not been thrown away on Aylmer. He could not imagine himself now without Alice. In spite of her ideas on the graphic arts, Alice was his air, his atmosphere, his oxygen, and also his umbrella to shield him from the hail of untoward circumstances. Curious, the process of love. It was the power of love that had put the picture in the tobacconist's window. Whatever power had put it there, no power seemed strong enough to get it out again. It lay exposed in the window for weeks and weeks and never drew a crowd, nor caused a sensation of any kind, not a word in the newspapers. London, the acknowledged art centre of the world, calmly went its way. The sole immediate result was that Prime changed his tobacconist and the direction of his promenades. At last, another singular event happened. Alice beamingly put five sovereigns into Prime's hand one evening. It's been sold for five guineas, she said joyous. Mr. Elmer didn't want to keep anything for himself, but I insisted on his having the odd shillings. I think it's splendid, simply splendid. Of course, I always did think it was a beautiful picture, she added. The fact was that this astounding sale for so large a sum as five pounds of a picture done in the attic by her Henry had enlarged her ideas of Henry's skill. She could no longer regard his painting as the caprice of a gentle lunatic. There was something in it. And now she wanted to persuade herself that she had known from the first there was something in it. The picture had been bought by the eccentric and notorious landlord of the Elk Hotel down by the river on a Sunday afternoon when he was not drunk but more optimistic than the state of English society warrants. He liked the picture because his public house was so unmistakably plain in it. He ordered a massive gold frame for it and hung it in his saloon bar. His career as a patron of the arts was unfortunately cut short by an order signed by his doctors for his incarceration in a lunatic asylum. All Putney had been saying for years that he would end in the asylum, and all Putney was right. End of chapter 7